And so we talked about the real Jesus and how we need to know, follow, and show the real Jesus. And so we're studying out the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke, there's a lot of things that take place around the table. And so we've been having people come up and share what their experience was like uh, coming in contact with the real Jesus. And so we're going to have the one and only, the world famous, Julie Barber. All right, I'm on the lapel mic now. Okay, all right, amen. There we go. Yes. All right, Julie, can you go ahead and uh, share a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm Julie Barber, married to Kenny Barber. Um, I've been a disciple for, it'll be 29 years in May, and I work for Chapman University. And I'm in the Fullerton Buena Park Bible Talk. Uh, yeah. Amen. Awesome. Mother of two. There you go. You okay. mentioned the kids. Mother of two, Courtney and Kelsey. <laughs> How old are they and what? Oh, Courtney is 20 and Kelsey is 19. Amen. Come on. They're off in, in college as well. Yes. And so let me ask you this. What was your idea of Jesus growing up? Well, I was so curious about Jesus. We used to have a Bible on our table. I don't know if you're familiar with Southern African American culture, but everybody has a Bible on their table that you can't touch, can't read, can't obey. It's just on the <laughs> table. And I was so curious about it. And I would sneak and look at the, at the pictures, like of the, you know, um, Michelangelo's ceiling and um, the picture, the classic picture of the hippie version of Jesus, the Caucasian long hair. And I thought he lived in my neighborhood because there were a lot of Jesus-like people in my neighborhood. And I, I remember this very clearly, being outside and thinking Jesus was walking across in front of my house. And I was like, today I'm going to stop and ask him if he's Jesus. <laughs> and I waited and waited. And I was like, oh, he's coming. Like, oh. And I, I literally said, are you Jesus? <laughs> and he just looked at me like, no. <laughs> no. But I really thought Jesus lived in my neighborhood. Uh, I, so I was so curious about Jesus. I just wanted to know what was in that book <laughs> and why. <laughs> why it was there and we couldn't touch it and why he lived around the corner and all, all of that. I was curious. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm sure he's still telling that story to me. Maybe. There you go. Amen. So uh, let me ask you this. How did you then come in contact with the real Jesus? It was definitely a journey. Um, in my neighborhood, we used to have like all kinds of denominations would come and bring their bus ministry and wanting to ex expose uh, people to the gospel. So I had a sampling of all kinds of churches. I've seen people slain in the spirit and healed and holy water. I mean, I had the whole uh, gambit of religious experiences and I found, I found a, a Bible-based church when I was little, but even then, uh, from 12 until 18, I was going to a church and felt like that was it. But when I was reading the Bible for myself, I remember the first book in the Bible I read, I was like 17 years old, still curious, and I was, remember reading it and thinking, this isn't what I have, though. It was the book of Acts. And it was just how people were so excited and they were doing things for each other. And, and I became really discouraged. Um, so I stopped going to church. And then I think when I was like 26 years old, I was in a really interesting, kind of a toxic relationship at the time. And um, a person that I had met from one of those experiences was, we, we had been friends and she was calling just to check up on our family. And she invited me out to church. And 
at the time I wasn't curious about church anymore. In fact, I was like, oh gosh, not church. But I, I wanted to serve her. I had just bought this shiny new car. She was a church hopper at this point. I was like, okay, I'll take you to church, old lady, right? <laughs> so I go and pick her up. And it was in, in somebody's house. It was a house church. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, she got me. Like, where, like what am I going to do? Like a house, like this is your church. This is my house. Um, but it was so different. It was so different. And, and then the, the, um, one of the sisters asked me if I wanted to just sit down and study the Bible. And it just changed my life. I mean, it was like the the first time, like seeing not just the doctrine, like the Bible base, but people who were living it out. And it was like, the com- like it coming together and it just encouraged me so much. And so when you, when you became familiar with the real Jesus, how did it change your life then? And then how does it still have an effect on you today? Well, like I, uh, in this relationship I was in, I told my um, boyfriend at the time, like, I think I'm going to really turn my life around. He was like, good for you. Okay. Um, And then I studied the Bible for a week and then I got baptized. And um, so from that Monday, I got baptized the following Monday. And all the while I was telling him, like, I'm going to change my life. And he came and I invited him to study the Bible with the brothers. He got baptized, and now he's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> it totally turned our toxic relationship into something that's healthy. Yeah. And it was just so incredible. We just made a decision that, you know, the Bible was going to be the standard. And, and like 20, almost 29 years, was still working to have that as our standard, still working to change the things that's coming up in our character, definitely not perfect, see things all the time, um, but letting the Bible be the standard. Amen. And so is there anything else that you're learning about the real Jesus? I, I think I go back to that curiosity, that little girl thinking that Jesus lived around the corner, um, just how, like, staying curious like how he's going to reveal himself, like in this stage of our life and like as um, parents to a young adults and empty nesters, like staying curious uh, who he's going to be for us now, who he's going to be for me now. Amen. Well, let's thank Julie there for sharing. We appreciate it. Here, right here. Thank you so much for that. I figured that was Kenny in the story, uh, but I didn't know if we were going to get there or not. So that's, uh, that's encouraging. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue our series uh, titled The Real Jesus. Again, we're looking through uh, what is a letter, but you can argue it's really more of a biography of the life and teachings and character of Jesus. And so we made several observations about Jesus, because it's important that we have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is, because if it's inaccurate, that will affect our daily lives, our choices, our faith, and could affect our eternity. And so as we've studied it out, we've learned several things, that the real Jesus is powerful, that he's not religious, but he's righteous, that he's a world changer who welcomes interruptions, that he challenges our worldviews, that he shows us how to love God and love our neighbor, that he gives us a voice, that he's full of grace and he's full of truth, that he finds what was lost, and as we saw last week, that he wasn't American. And so today, what we're going to be discussing is how the real Jesus is inspiring. The real Jesus is inspiring. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for already being inspired in the faith. God, being able to not only hear about our brothers and sisters, but being able to sing to you and being able to rejoice because of the life that we have in Christ. Not only the life that we have today, but the hope that we have for tomorrow, but the hope that we have for eternity 
in Christ. And God, being able to hear how Julie Barber and also Kenny, how they came to know the real Jesus and to see the impact 20 plus years later. And God, we pray right now that you will teach us, you will guide us, you will help us to be curious about Jesus, not only for this time, but God, for the rest of our lives. And we pray that we may walk away not only inspired, but God, with decisions made to follow Jesus. It's in his name. Amen. Turn over in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 19. You know, the real Jesus was inspiring to those who followed him, was inspiring to those who listened to him. And he still is inspiring today. And it's his life, the way he lived, it's his character, it's his teachings that make him so inspiring. It makes him the most unique figure ever to walk the earth. I love, you know, some of you know I'm, I'm a huge rap fan. And uh, I, I no longer listen to a lot of the old rap that I used to, but now I listen to uh, a lot of uh, what I call holy hip hop, or it's called Christian rap. And, and so, I, man, one of my favorite artists, he has this line and he says, the real, he, no, he says, uh, Jesus, actually going with you, what you said earlier, Julie, Jesus wasn't a hippie picking lilies with his friends. Jesus was a man's man, so men followed him. And I remember hearing that line for the first time, and I just got excited. I was like, that's so true. He wasn't this hippie picking lilies with his friends, but he was a man's man. And so men followed him to the point at which they would die for their faith in him. And I said, that's the real Jesus. He's not a, a figure who just inspired. He is the inspiration for our lives. And so let's go on over to Luke 19. Church, are you with me here? Luke 19, we're going to read in verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. That's important that it mentions. This is only really the only time it's mentioned in Scripture about a chief tax collector. And that's important for us to know because it means he wasn't just a tax collector. It means he was overseeing other tax collectors. He was the, the CFO, if you will. He was, he was a little head honcho in his realm there as far as being with the tax collectors. We continue. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, why'd they have to put that in there? But you know, I do appreciate that, that they put that in there. Because why? What happens? It says, uh, because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore, a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Zacchaeus is resourceful. Come on, short people. Where are you at? Let's be resourceful. Me and Twan, you know what I'm saying? We know what's up. Anytime it has short people in there, I get fired up. You know what I'm saying? Especially when it's good. Amen. All right, let's continue reading. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I just love that about Jesus. He invites himself over for dinner. You ever, ever had somebody invite themselves over to dinner? Hey, I'm going to have dinner at your house. Well, what you mean you coming over to my house? You know what I'm saying? But if Jesus said, you're like, all right, here we go. Get out the best china. You know what I'm saying? And so it says, he so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He is gone to be a guest of a sinner? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. We'll stop right there. You see the grace and the mercy and the hope that Jesus has for this outcast, this sinful outcast in Zacchaeus. Again, he's a chief tax collector. That means amongst the Jews, he's one of the most hated individuals because he's seen as a traitor, because he's working for the Romans, but he's also known for cheating people in the collection of their taxes. And so he's been ostracized. He's been outcast. You can't even come to our local synagogue, our local church service because you're a tax collector. And so again, he's on the outside and he's viewed as sinful and he probably was a sinful man. But yet Jesus says what to him? He says, salvation has come to this house. 
salvation, meaning a right relationship with God. Zacchaeus has turned from this to now having salvation. And what's so interesting and powerful and inspiring is, number one, Jesus has the ability to give salvation to others. You and I can't give salvation to anyone. No prophet before could give salvation, but yet Jesus here is giving salvation. What does that mean? Whoa, he's somebody special. He's divine because only a divine figure can do this. But yet he gives salvation and he says this to him. He says, this man too is a son of Abraham. If you're Zacchaeus, how did that statement hit you? You've been outcast. You're sinful. You've been looked down upon. And now Jesus says, no, 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 no. Hey, hey, I'm bringing salvation, but guess what? And I'm going to let the whole community know right now that you aren't an outcast anymore. No, you're part of God's spiritual family. You're beloved like all those others who would be in the lineage of faith from Abraham. He says this too, and everybody was probably shocked. Whoa, whoa this man's a sinner. No way he could be a part of it. We've excluded him. But Jesus says, no, salvation has come. And this man is included in the spiritual family. Again, this is incredible. This is grace. This is mercy. This is hope that Jesus offers. You know, it's interesting. Just a quick side note. We know we don't really know if Jesus had the key has followed through on his commitment, on his promise. We don't really know. And maybe he did. Maybe he did it. Regardless, we, we can observe and make this observation that Jesus looks at and knows the hearts. So whether he had him do it, maybe to test his heart so that he can see it, or he didn't because he knew this man would do it and it's unnecessary. We don't know, but we do know that Jesus sees the heart and he'll decide when to test that heart. And so we continue in Luke chapter 19, I'm sorry, earlier I said 10, it meant to say 19. Luke chapter 19 and verse 37, let's continue to read. It says, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. This is what we are selling or what we have today is Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday before the resurrection Sunday. And so as Jesus enters, here's the scene. And it says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What are they praising God for? The miracles they had seen him do. His lifestyle. They got to the point where they're so fired up that they're like, man, we're just going to praise you as Jesus is coming down this, 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 this hill here. And I've been able to go to Jerusalem and see this isn't a two minute walk. And so as he's walking down, people are there and, and the other gospels tell us how they got palm branches and they put it on the ground. They even got their cloaks and they put it on the ground so Jesus can walk on them. Who would do that for such a man unless he was what? Inspiring unless he had did something to, 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 to trigger and to stir this emotion. And they think that he's going to be this earthly king who's going to come in and now he's going to take down the Romans. And so they don't even have the full picture of who Jesus is, but yet they're praising him in loud voices. And it says because of the miracles they had seen. You know, that's interesting because if you look through the Gospels, Jesus' miracles aren't the miracles that you and I would have engaged in or would have actually fulfilled or done. You guys are performed. Jesus wasn't doing miracles, but like, hey, check this out. Look at me. How cool is this? Hey, guys, you want to see something really cool? Look what I can do. He didn't do that. But his miracles were what? Most of all, healing. Most of all, in service and help to other people in need. And his miracles revealed God's nature. And so we see this is what they're in all. These are miracles of going. Look at this cool magician who can do these awesome, cool things that we can't figure out. They saw miracles that helped other people. And miracles that revealed God. Again, the people that followed Jesus, that knew him, they were inspired by him. But also what we can see, the boldness of Jesus in this part. 
You see, what we learn from the, the book of John, chapter 11, verse 47, 57, you can write that down, is that Jesus at this time, there was a price on his head. And so everybody knew that the Pharisees were looking to get Jesus. But yet Jesus goes into town with such great fashion. Now think about this. If you knew that the authorities, the police, we're going to arrest you at church service, what would you do? Some of you wouldn't be here. I'll check y'all out online. But if you did decide to come, who knows, what would you probably do? You'd probably come, get a little hat, get a fake mustache and beard, and try to disguise yourself, wouldn't you? Let me slide in through the back. Hey, Kenny, Julie, where's the side door? Can I be in the back? Can nobody call my name out so that I can just worship in peace? You guys get what I'm saying? We would try to figure out in which we would not call attention to ourselves. But is that Jesus in this moment? No, he comes in and it's clear. He's making a statement and those who knew their Bibles knew, wait a second, this is a proclamation of the Messiah. And so Jesus didn't run, he didn't hide, he didn't disguise who he was at this moment, he's coming in and he's like, yes, the Messiah is here. Wait, there's people that want to arrest him. What boldness of Jesus. What courage. This wasn't a hippie picking lilies with his friends. Jesus was bold, he was courageous. And we see sheer courage. That's the describing nature of Jesus, deliberately riding into town so that every eye was fixed on him even though he's got a price on his head and you can consider him an outlaw at this point. That's inspiring. That's incredible of the real Jesus. Let's continue reading Luke 19, verse 45. Church, are you still with me here? When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Again, we see great conviction and boldness from Jesus. They're selling, they're, they made the, the church service, this grand opportunity of, of, of the Pentecost here and great celebration. Now it's a marketplace, it's a flea market. And people can't worship it in true fashion, the way God designed and wanted them to do. So Jesus goes over here and he, he drives people out. So we see the boldness, we see the conviction, and we see the religious leaders. What do they do? They want to what? They want to kill him. You know, this is what's incredible, again, about the real Jesus, is that the real Jesus is going to provoke a response in some form or fashion. You can't be indifferent about Jesus. You see, Jesus is either going to inspire you or he's going to offend you. Because his grace and truth is going to inspire you and say, wow, this is the true living God. Let me follow this. Or you're going to be offended and say, oh, how could you say such things? How could you say things that apply to me? I don't want this. In fact, I'm going to reject this. You see, the real Jesus you can't stand in the middle on the fence with. You either make a decision to follow him or you make a decision to reject him and try to stop him. But it says that all the people hung on his words. They couldn't wait to hear what's he going to say. His words were powerful. They were insightful. They were inspiring. They had depth. They had never heard teaching in the authority in which he taught. And so it says they hung on his words. They were waiting. What's he going to say next? They had the religious leaders going, hold on, we can't do anything because these people are so inspired by him that it'll cause a riot right now. Which we know led to them going in secrets and in, in the dark, in the shadows in order to get Jesus. But we see his word is powerful. His presence, his teaching is moving and stirring. Let's continue in chapter 20. It says in verse 19, the teachers of the law and the, pre and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people keeping a close watch on him. They sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might 
hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies question him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And then they go on and they start to ask him questions. Again, these are spies. It says they intended to be sincere. Let's go ahead and let, let, let's have a little fluff here about your character. But, you know, it's interesting, even though they have th this, this uh, we know you're so great and all these things are not being sincere. They had to say these things because they knew others around him thought that way of him, which shows the lifestyle that Jesus had. But they go in there, they're sincere and they're trying to trap them. Now, let me ask you this. When you know people are trying to trap you in your words, that they're being insincere, how do you feel in those moments? What do you feel like doing? How do you respond? I know for me, that's a challenge. If I feel like, whoa, you're trying to trap me, you're trying to get me, I usually don't respond in a righteous fashion. There's usually a, a, a bucking back. There's usually now this wall that comes up, and I might react or say something in a way that I wouldn't have if I thought the situation was different. You, can you guys relate to that? Well, let's see how Jesus responded. So he goes and he says something, but here are some of the, the reactions to Jesus and his words. It says they were unable to trap him in what he said there in the public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. Then they asked him some more. They sent some other people to ask him a question. And he says, some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. Look how Jesus operates amongst his savior haters, amongst his ops, amongst his enemies. How does he respond? He's cool, he's calm, he's collected, he's peaceful, but yet he's righteous. And he silences all the critics. Wow. He got us. Well, you know what? Let's not ask him any more questions because that's making us look bad. Let's not ask him any more questions because we can't trap him. He's too good. He has too much truth. There's too much character. There's too much integrity. You know what? We'll figure out another plan. It's incredible how Jesus navigates through these waters. And he's not doing this in a political way. You know, in our realm and in our context here, we, we know a lot of times we have politicians or, 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 or people that are famous and they get asked questions and we know they tend to give the political answer, Right. And they give an answer and it's like, oh, okay, well, what was that? that? That more makes people frustrated just by the fact of the lack of honesty in many ways or lack of sincerity. But yet Jesus doesn't respond in a political fashion. He gives truth to the point where they go, whoa, we're silent. Again, this is incredible about our Lord here. He handles it with conviction, righteousness, and truth. Then we jump on over to chapter 21. And Jesus starts to reveal that Jerusalem is going to fall. And he's going to reveal that uh, uh, about God's final judgment. And so he talks more about the fall of Jerusalem, but he starts to also mention God's judgment. And so in chapter 21, we take it up in the middle of this discourse. And it says, there will be signs in the sun, moon and stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaking. At that time, they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin, begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Jesus is talking about his return. See, the real Jesus is going to return. I said the real Jesus is going to return return. The real Jesus is going to return. He's not the hippie figure that we think lives on our block. He's going to return, and this is helpful for you and me. He's not a, he's not a heroic figure of the past. He's not Lincoln. He's not, he, he's not Martin Luther King. He's not whoever you can think of who's dead and will never come back. He's the Messiah who will return. And he will redeem all those who are in Christ. Again, what does that mean? He's divine. We don't worship somebody who's dead and long gone. Jesus does live on our block right now. Not in the physical form, but in the spiritual form. 
And so the real Messiah, the real Jesus, Jesus made clear, I will come back and your redemption will be there. Again, this is no historical figure here in Jesus. This is the divine son of God. And he points to the fact that he's going to return. And just a side note, he makes it clear, but he also says, you have to read it on your own. Hey, you won't know the exact time and hour. So don't try to figure it out. It's so unfortunate that nowadays we have so many people claiming to know when Jesus is coming back and they continue to be wrong. What's going to be in 1980, 1989, wasn't the year 2000. Well, he's going to show up in Africa next week. No, let's stop trying to guess. Here's the point Jesus is making. He's going to return. So prepare now and live right now so that if he comes tomorrow, you're in line with his will. So that should call us to urgency to get reconciled with people we're not reconciled with. That should call us to urgency to get right with God if we're not right with God. That should call us to be urgent about getting ourselves on the right track if we've been slipping and falling in our relationship with God. Because the Son of God will return. And what does he want to find us doing when he returns? Are we in anticipation for his return? Brothers and sisters, are you with me, church? Let's go on over to Luke 21, verse 33 here. It goes on. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Did you hear that? His words will never pass away. Jesus has the words of eternal life. His word is eternal. We might have had some great uh, uh, words being spoken by, by many, uh, you know, we, we can think of uh, words uh, of Lincoln and Kennedy King. We can think of uh, uh, great Greek philosophers and Roman philosophers and all those words might be cool and helpful, but none of them are eternal. But Jesus' word, says, hey, when a new earth and new heaven comes, a word will remain. He has the words of eternity. His word is eternal. It's not just wisdom for the day, but it's wisdom for all eternity. That's the Jesus of the Bible. That's the Jesus of Nazareth. That's the real Jesus. And so I ask you, are you inspired by the real Jesus? If you're not inspired by the real Jesus, it's one of two things. You don't know the real Jesus. If you're not inspired by the real Jesus, because you don't know the real Jesus. You have an inaccurate, you have an incomplete or a counterfeit version of Jesus. And so, of course, that version isn't inspiring. Or... You've been out of touch with the real Jesus. And so many of us here in our congregation, we came to a relationship with the real Jesus, but we haven't been inspired by Jesus of late. Why is that? Has Jesus changed? Did he all of a sudden become inspiring to uninspiring? Did he change in his character? Did he somehow transfer and transition his teachings so that they, would be, they would may be less? No, it's because we have made choices to drift from our connection with the real Jesus. And so therefore, our inspiration has dwindled. And so our connection to the fellowship isn't what it used to be. Our relationship with God is struggling, and maybe some of us in here are thinking about possibly leaving God. But Jesus is reminding us here today of who he is, his character, his teaching, and he's calling us back today, not just to know him, but to have a relationship with him. And then when we have a real relationship with him, then of course we will be inspired because the real Jesus was inspiring and he still is inspiring today, church. You know, inspiration is powerful and it's needed, isn't it? You know, I heard uh, uh, the other day, um, I was, actually it was yesterday, uh, a sister shared how uh, she wants to make, she wants to have a career in which she's passionate about. And those of us who go to work every day, we know when you go to work every day and it's not inspiring, it's not passionate, what is that like? That's tough. That's tough sledding right there, right? It's hard to be motivated. We also know that inspiration, it's needed and it's powerful. It can do something to us, 
Well, we have inspiration. A couple years ago, my son and I, Dominique, baby boy, we were uh, actually Karina's with us too as well. We were watching the funeral for Kobe Bryant. And so Kobe Bryant, the funeral, it's at, it's at you know, what is it? Uh, Crypto.com Center or whatever it is now. It was Staples Center at the time. And so they're showing Kobe and they're showing all these clips. And after it's over, right after it's over, my son Dominique goes into our little backyard with a basketball and he starts shooting. I was like, Karina, this is the moment that he's going to be the next Kobe Bryant. I said, I'm, I'm taking mental note. I'm like, no, this is crazy. I'm like, there's nothing. We didn't say, let's go play basketball. He was just watching this and he decided, let's go out to the hoop and let's start shooting. And I'm like, whoa, this is phenomenal. He was inspired just by what he saw. And there's no way he really knew what was going on, but he was inspired. And I thought, whoa, that's incredible. But you know, the same should happen for you and me spiritually when we take note of who the real Jesus is. We should be inspired. We go, wait a second, I see who he is. Now I want to go out and what? Be like him. I want to live the way he lived. I want to share his teachings. I want to live an inspiring life the way he inspired my life. Nobody has to tell me and force me. It's because I see who he is, how awesome, how great he is, and I want that. You see, the real Jesus is inspiring. So if you're not moved, something is wrong in your connection with the real Jesus. And I appeal to you, I beg of you, get in real contact with the real Jesus. He's incredible. There's no way you can stand there and be like, oh, he's just okay. No, he's either going to offend you and you're going to reject it, or you're going to be like, I want to give my life to this. You know, we're going to have a baptism later on, Mauricio. He decided he was so inspired by Jesus, he's given his life to Christ today. Amen. I don't know about you, but the real Jesus fires me up. I've been so, oh, I've been geeking out every week as we've been looking at Jesus. I'm like, yo, this is so cool. I'm like, this is awesome. And I'm reminded that that's the Jesus who I said I wanted to follow when I got baptized. When I said Jesus is Lord in 2001, it's because I was inspired by that Jesus. And I said, I want to give my life over to him. And at every stage over the last 20 plus years, it's because of Jesus that has kept me going. And it's Jesus that makes me want to become more like him now today, to live the way he lived. It makes me want to share Jesus with others because I'm like, I'm sitting on this treasure. I I won the lotto. This is $3 billion lottery here in Christ. How can I sit here and not share that with anybody? There's no way I can do that. You don't need to tell me. You don't need to give me invitations to Easter. Man, I know the real Jesus. This is treasure. I want to help other people have this treasure. But when I'm not in that state, it's become clear I've drifted in some form or fashion in my connection, my knowledge, and understanding of who Jesus is. That's what it is for me. As I've drifted in some form or fashion from following the real Jesus. And so what do we need to do? Is we need to go ahead and fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the 1984 edition, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose hearts. You see, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we get the example on how to live, but we also get inspired, the motivation to keep going in our faith. When we look to the real Jesus, we can persevere under the trials of life. When we fix our eyes on the real Jesus, we gain confidence that we can become victorious in this life and also in our spiritual battles. When we fix our eyes on the real Jesus, we start to live an inspiring life the way he did and it inspires others. We got to keep our eyes fixed on the real Because if we don't, then we drift. I know everyone here doesn't want to drift, but you want to succeed and you want to excel in your faith in Christ. So let's get real practical here. Action step and prayer for the week here. And so it's been encouraging to be praying these prayers all together and to be able to have the opportunity to do something all together in a communal way here. 
And so it says, here we go. Make a list of the things that inspire you about Jesus. So just make a list, whether it's big, small, it can be uh, detailed, whatever the case may be. Reflect on it. Pray about it. Make decisions to cut out whatever sin is stopping you from following the real Jesus and imitate it this week. I'd encourage you to save it and to keep it, to use it and pull it out at times in which you're not strong in the faith. And then here's the ask here is that we can all pray together here, that we can all pray. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Let's go back here. Not sure what happened. You go back there. Uh, I guess it's missing there. All right, here we go. Write this down. Pray every day this week. Please pray every day this week that our entire ministry will be inspired by Jesus and respond to it. So I'll say that again. Please pray every week that not just you, not just your family group, not just your college ministry, but pray that everybody in our ministry will be inspired by Jesus and respond to it. Make it a decision to not just know the real Jesus, but to follow the real Jesus and show the real Jesus. As you can see, we have the singers on stage. We're doing things a little differently here today. We're going to sing some songs here as we respond to the inspiration of Jesus. And we are here at our worship service because of Jesus. So we want to honor and worship him right now. And so we're going to fix our eyes on the real Jesus and be inspired by him. And so I close out again in, in Hebrews 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such, who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. God, I'm so excited. You know, I get, I, I just, I just be, I just, it's all inspiring whenever I get a chance to just really delve into the life, the teachings, and the character of Jesus. And God, as we try to fix our eyes upon him right now, help us, God, to not be distracted, but to fix our eyes on the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross, God, who saved us from our sin, who saved us from our past, and gives us hope, not only for today, but for the future here on earth, but God, the hope of eternity with you. We thank you, Lord, for being bold. We thank you for being courageous. Thank you for being compassionate and gracious. Thank you for giving those like Zacchaeus. All of us in some way were like Zacchaeus and we were sinful and we we're outside of your will. But thank you that you too call us a son and daughter, not only of Abraham, but of the living God. We thank you, Lord, for being kind. We thank you for your grace and your truth. And we thank you that you will return. We thank you for being our inspiration, our motivation, our rock, our redeemer, our joy, our hope, our lives, our salvation. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.